<laughs> so here we are for another episode of um, 12 Dozen Things About Colorado. So far we've done what it's taken to become a state. We have done um, mountains, rivers, we've done lifescapes and life zones and ecoregions. We did history of wildlife and help, how it helped Colorado settle at the pace that it did. We did the National Forests of Colorado, the National Parks of Colorado, the State Parks of Colorado. We did the Wildlife Diversity of Colorado. And we did something else last month. Iconic, Iconic Natural Landmarks. There you go. <laughs> and that brings us to this month, another 12 dozen things about Colorado. So, this would be session 11 of 12. And we are going to call this one state symbols. Do you have any idea at all how many state symbols we have? No. Take a guess. Twelve. Twelve, Twelve. Twelve dozen. No. <laughs> Try not to. It's just. Yeah. <laughs> I told you this program makes me cranky and you're not helping. <laughs> Twelve maybe? Fifteen? Fifteen. Twenty? Thirty? Yeah, it's really kind of hard to tell in all of this, isn't it? Because what is it that makes something a state symbol? Well, let's do a little uh, chronology for some context here, and then we'll tackle some of them. I split them into two different groups. Those that are, are about wildlife and related to nature and natural history and what have you, and those that aren't. And so those that are not nature-related include these even our state name is considered a state motto by Colorado Revised Statutes and the Secretary of State. So our state name, we have a state nickname. Do you have any idea what our nickname is? Colorful, Red. Colorful Colorado, that is a motto. Centennial. Centennial State because we were the only state to come into existence in the 100th year anniversary of the country. We have a state motto, a state seal, we have two state songs, a gemstone. We have a folk dance. <laughs> we even have a state tartan. And we have a state sport. So we need to cover a few of these just to sort of give you an idea of how weird some of this gets. For example, Colorado's state motto is that and it all depends on whether you speak actual Latin or whether you speak anglicized Latin. If you speak regular old Latin, it's nil sine numine. But if you speak anglicized Latin, it's nil sine numen. Okay, don't go there. Just let it in. But this thing can be interpreted four different ways. And one of them is nothing without providence. And then another interpretation is nothing without deity. And another one is nothing without God. Are you ready for the fourth one? You so cannot see this coming. And I cannot make this stuff up. Goes back to the mining days of the 1800s. That's one thing that's kind of bizarre. We have a state uh, motto and we can't figure out what it says. Our state song has a two-part controversy. One is almost nobody knows that we have an actual state song. And of those that know that we have a state song, not very many of them know what it is. And even among those who know what the song is, they, they have no idea what the tune or the words are, so they can't sing it, can't even hum it. And if somebody was playing it on the radio, they wouldn't be able to say, that's our state song. <laughs> Anybody here know our first state song? See, there you go. Hey, well, along came a group of people a number of years ago, and they said, that original state song, Where the Columbine Grows, oh, yeah, that song. Yeah, how often do you hear that on the radio? <laughs> They said, you know, a better song that is more up-to-date and more representative of Colorado is John Denver's Rocky Mountain High. Well, at the time that was brought up, there was this whole backlash against it because a Rocky Mountain High was advocating <coughs> marijuana. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And where are we today? 
50 states in the union and Colorado's number one in marijuana sales and so where did that go? Nowhere. So we have two official state songs because instead of dropping one and replacing it they decided to just add to it. So we have two official state songs. One that nobody knows and the other one that most people sort of can get along with me in. Yeah. <laughs> And then we, we, we have a state sport, and it's burrow racing. You know, I would have figured something like skiing, you know, or even the Denver Broncos, even in a bad year, you know, but burrow racing. Do you realize that if 50 people actually participate in burrow racing, that's only one out of every 116,000 residents in the state of Colorado? And that's our official state sport. How many of you have ever ridden a burro? How many of you have raced a burro? How many of you would know a burro when you see one? <laughs> well, okay, see you're at least there. So burro racing got up and going in Leadville and Fair Play and a few places like that. And they had so much fun doing it. Thanks to Rocky Mountain High, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> they made a proposal to make it the state sport, and nobody disagreed and put up skiing or anything else, and so they passed it. So our official state sport is burrow racing. How long ago was that? That was only um, 2013, something like that. 2012? Yeah, pretty recently. Okay. You got my curiosity up. 2012. Now we have to do this again. <laughs> have I told you about our state motto? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you can go faster than that. Yes, you can. So, that's enough of the really weird stuff. Let's just move on to the, some people shouldn't be allowed to make the decisions stuff. <laughs> the stuff that's related to nature. That would be these right here. We have 12 of these. So if you have 13 of those and 12 of these, we have 25 official state symbols. How many of you even can comprehend 25 state symbols? So we have a f state flower, a bird tree, animal, fossil, all the way down. We have an official state pet. <laughs> We're going to have to talk about that one. A state cactus and all sorts of things in here. So here are some stories about these official state symbols. Thing one is the first state symbol that was established was the Columbine, but the revised statutes don't tell us which one. There are 22 Columbines in North America. Nine of those occur in Colorado. And so it describes it as a white and lavender, but it's in lower case. So we don't know if the original people who did this thought white and lavender columbine was an actual species or if it was just descriptive as opposed to the red one or the yellow one or what have you. But all of them are in the buttercup family and it was originally found as a new species to North American botanists on the Stephen Long expedition of 1820. And the botanist Edwin James is the guy who collected it and got it named. So just a few thoughts about this. They cite it as the white and lavender, but we don't know if that's a description or an actual name. The statutes spell it C-A-E, but its actual spelling is C-O-E. So our state laws can't spell right. I'm just throwing this out here. And the, it's, it's described as our state flower. Now, in botany, a flower is a reproductive part of a plant. But if, just think of a rose. You, you think of the flower on the rose, but the rose has got a stem and leaves and a root system and everything else. It's the whole plant that has identity, not just the flower on the plant. So, to be botanically with it, we really should have a state wildflower and not just a state flower. 
I I'm just saying. <laughs> Thing two, we have an official state bird. And this came about in 1931 as a result of the work of Roy Langdon, who was a civics teacher at uh, Fort Collins High School. And in the 1920s, as part of the classwork, he was trying to show his students what was involved in the process of legislation and lawmaking and what have you. So he proposed to have the lark bunting made our official state bird. Well, Catherine Craig was the state superintendent of schools and she said, well, if this guy in Fort Collins schools is going to propose this, we need to open this up to students all over the state. So she set up this this uh, opportunity to make a recommendation for a state bird and after a list, list was made then all the students could vote on it and in her way of reckoning it it came down to two possibilities a meadow lark or a bluebird but as other people pointed out there are already three other states that have bluebirds as their state bird and two other states that have meadow larks so what do those two birds have to say as something special about Colorado. Nothing! And the state legislature just kind of went, ah! And they tabled it and wouldn't vote on it. And the next thing you know is the whole thing became national news. <laughs> and there were magazine articles written about it and newspaper articles and one wildlife group out of some kind of, of I don't know, Rocky Mountain High, I don't know. They actually got a live snowy owl and sent it to the state legislature so that we could have a night owl as our state bird. Other people recommended in the news that we could have the goonie bird or the dodo. <laughs> so it was getting out of hand and finally in 1931 it came back up as a, a proposal and Langdon took his classes down there to the state legislature and they made their sales pitch and finally it won the day. So the lark bunting is our official state bird as of 1931. But just a few thoughts. One of those is that the lark bunting is neither a lark, which is in the family a laudidae, and it's not a bunting, which is in the family of cardinals. In fact, it is a sparrow, <laughs> which means our official state bird is ornithologically and taxonomically illiterate. Is that what you want representing you? <laughs> they can't spell the name of a wildflower and they can't figure out what kind of bird this is. I'm telling you, these are not people you should put in charge of your financial decisions. <laughs> That brings up thing three. We have a state tree. And it was voted by school kids all around the state of Colorado on Arbor Day in 1892 to establish the blue spruce as our official state tree. But it was never officially sanctioned. There was no paperwork, no governor or legislature did anything about it until 1939. So the kids who voted on it were grandparents by the time they actually did something about it. Though the blue spruce grows more abundantly in Colorado than any of the other five states where it occurs, none of the other six spruce trees in North America have a state name on them. So there's no Montana spruce or California spruce or any of that sort of thing. And so why do we need Colorado on there? We've got a black spruce and we've got a white spruce and we have a red spruce and we have a blue spruce. So why call it Colorado blue spruce? I, I, I'm just throwing this out here, people. Because it's a state symbol, so we ought to put Colorado on there. Well, to that. <laughs> Thing four, animals. I, you just want a little tidbit? Anybody have relatives from South Dakota? No? Have you heard of South Dakota? Yeah. <laughs> You've heard of the Black Hills? Yeah. One of the things that people in the Black Hills love are things black. Black this, black that, because they're in the Black Hills. Well, there's a white spruce and a black spruce, 
and they like to think of all their trees in the Black Hills as black spruces, but the reality is they're white spruces. <laughs> the cosmos is taunting. Well, let's go back to this one. We have a state animal and it's the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. Mammalogists recognize in the whole wide world there are five species of sheep. One of them is the domestic sheep that we're familiar with. It gives us wool and what have you. Two of the wild sheep naturally occur in North America. One is the doll sheep and it's only up in Alaska. The other one is the bighorn sheep or the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and it's right here in Colorado. And it grows true horns as opposed to the antlers that you get on elk or moose or deer or that sort of thing. But a few thoughts. D do you see a trend here? <laughs> Colorado revised statutes cite this as the state animal. You with me? Yeah. However, we also have a state amphibian, bird, fish, insect, and reptile, all of those are animals. Which means this guy is, should be our state mammal, not a state animal. But in the Colorado Revised Statutes, it's a state animal. But when you get some of the stuff like on Wikipedia or a map or what have you, They'll refer to it as a state mammal, but that's not the official name on it. It's a state animal. Hmm. We have a state fossil. Do you know the story behind this? That's a heck of a story. What's that? Kids again. Kids, yeah. Back, way back in uh, 1877, a guy named Felch discovered some fossil bones right outside of Morrison, Colorado. And those were, were taken by and evaluated by Othniel Marsh, who was one of the two guys that got involved in the bone wars of the late 1700s. The other guy was Edward Cope. Are you familiar with the bone wars? No. Oh, that's a heck of a story. I, I could do a two-hour program just on that. These two guys were so driven to be the number one fossil finder in the country that they had these crews and they'd go out and excavate all over everywhere, Wyoming and South Dakota and Montana and Colorado. And the idea was to find as many fossils as they could and especially to outdo the other guy. Well, they started sending out spies to follow the other guys <laughs> so that when the other guys shut down for the winter, they could send a team in and re-excavate the site and get their fossils before they could get them next year. So what they would start doing is when they would come to a place like Denver or to Cheyenne, they would send out three different groups so that the, the spy that was following would end up wandering around with somebody and not end up anywhere and the other guys would sneak off and go to the quarries. <laughs> Can you believe that? So Marsh ended up by winning. He actually was able to identify 76 different kinds of, of fossils and Cope only managed 54. So Marsh came out on top. But both of them were really snarky. They criticized each other openly in speeches and in their publications and in their writing and it was just downright nasty but it turns out we got a uh, stegosaurus but it was only partial and the thing about it is in 19 about 1979 1980 there was a high school teacher in canyon city that took out a group of his students on a field trip north of Canyon City and they found some bones that were fossils right out on the ground and he recognized this as being pretty remarkable so he contacted what was then known as the Denver Museum of Natural History they sent two guys out met up with him he took them out in the field and they said wow this is special they excavated the site and they found a stegosaurus there but what was special about it was it was the first time a complete skeleton of a stegosaurus had been found anywhere in the world. There are four, five, six thousand uh, individual stegosaurus fossils that were excavated, but they would be partial. They wouldn't have the whole thing. And this one ended up by being the whole 
uh, whole animal. So uh, it, it became our official state fossil by executive order of Governor Richard Lamb. The thing is, nobody ever told us which of the three different kinds of stegosauruses that occur in Colorado is our official one. So if it's a stegosaurus, regardless of species, that's it. It's official. So did you have any idea we had three different kinds of stegosauruses found in Colorado? See, the things you can learn on a Tuesday, people. We have an official state grass, and it has nothing to do with Rocky Mountain High. There are 310 species of grasses that grow wild in Colorado, and blue grandma is found in 61 of our 64 counties. So it is about the third most widespread of all the naturally occurring grasses here. There are two Asian grasses that occur in all 64 counties, but they're exotics that were brought in by people. So this is our native grass, and one of the things that's really identifiable about it is this time of year, the flower heads arch backwards and they get this curve to them and they only grow about that tall and so it's really easy to recognize them when you see them. Well, Blue Grandma became the official state grass as a way for various government entities and schools and what have you to educate people about how important this grass was to the settlement of Colorado because it's what the elk ate and the bighorn sheep ate and the pronghorns ate and during the early years of the railroad building and the mining those animals were the food supply for the laborers and then when those animals were dwindling away and ranching came in that's the grass that the cattle and the sheep were eating and so that grass was what fed the animals that became the meat supply for the people settling into Colorado and we now know that it is incredibly valuable in ecosystems because it stabilizes soil and it holds water and as a consequence the wind can't blow the topsoil away and snow melt and rainwater can't wash it away and so it figures really importantly in anchoring soil and keeping ecosystems healthy and so those were the kinds of reasons that prompted somebody to promote blue grandma as our official state grass. We have a state fish, and it's not that one. But if you've been around a while, you probably think it was that one, a rainbow trout. It became promoted and recognized as our state fish back in about 1954, 55, 56, somewhere in there. And for years and years and years, 30 years, it was promoted as our official state fish and it was on the highway maps and it was in this chart and that poster and what have you. Well, probably the reason why that happened was back in the 1800s there was a guy by the name of Spencer Fullerton Baird who was the assistant secretary of the Smithsonian. And one of his biggest jobs was to compile and publish all the results of the transcontinental railroad surveys like Gunnison did and all those other guys. But Congress finally established what was called the U.S. Fish Commission because a lot of fisheries were disappearing and the fishes were going away because of overfishing and commercial fishing and because of toxins in the water because of mining and that sort of thing. And so Baird's responsibility was to figure out how to develop fish hatcheries to grow fishes to turn them loose to try and recover fish populations. Well, out of all the state and federal fish hatcheries, the number one fish that responded the best and the most productively to hatchery rearing was a rainbow trout. And it succeeded so well that it ended up by being dispersed around the entire world. You can go to Peru, you can go to Chile, you can go to Africa, Mongolia, you can go to New Zealand and catch rainbow trout down there because it's been taken all around the world. And it became the most abundant catchable fish in the state of Colorado. So people thought, why not? Well, along comes a group of students in the 1980s that are part of a student uh, chapter of the American Fisheries Society 
in the Department of Wildlife Biology, Fisheries and Wildlife Biology at CSU, and they got the idea that it would be more appropriate if our state fish were a native, and especially if it were a fish that only lived in the state of Colorado. So they started to propose that the greenback cutthroat trout should become our official state fish. And so they went to work on it and found out that there was no paperwork that made the rainbow trout official, so we did not have an official state fish. So when they proposed the greenback cutthroat trout, it just slipped right through and, and was pretty easy. Well, the problem was that out of about 11 subspecies of cutthroat trouts, the greenback is the only one unique to Colorado. It's not in Wyoming, it's not in New Mexico or Utah or anywhere else. But because of all the development on the Front Range, it had dwindled to the point where they thought it was gone. Uh -huh. And there was a, a professor of fisheries biology at CSU by the name of Bob Benke, and he was fishing in Rocky Mountain National Park in the late 50s, and he found some in some mountain lakes in Rocky Mountain National Park. Those were brought into hatcheries to try and raise them so they could be stocked back out and recover the greenback population. But because of this whole thing about raising fish in hatcheries, both at the federal and the state level, Colorado had brought in about five other subspecies of cutthroat trouts, the Snake River cutthroat, the Yellowstone cutthroat, the Sierra cutthroat, and what have you. And because all, all these cutthroats are the same species, but they're geographically distinct subspecies, there was interbreeding going on. And so now we have these special techniques by looking at DNA and chromosomes and we can figure out where the mixed breeds are, the mongrels, and where the pure breeds are. And almost all of the greenback cutthroat trouts in Colorado were found to be mixes of at least two, if not three or four, different subspecies. So the question is, do we have any naturally occurring greenbacks left alive in the wild and a population of them was found in a creek west of Colorado Springs. So that creek is now protected. They brought some of those fishes into captivity. They're trying to raise them and so they can stock them back out and try to recover the greenback cutthroat trout as a fish unique to Colorado. At the time of settlement, we could only document 52 different kinds of fishes living wild in the state of Colorado. And of those 52, this subspecies is the only one unique to Colorado. And that's why these students proposed to make it our official state fish. <laughs> See how there's a story in everything? So, preserving this subspecies of, of the cutthroat trout may or may not work. It all depends on how things turn out and funding and new testing techniques and all that sort of thing. But over time, we'll figure out, yes, we have saved it or no, it's gone. Thing eight, we have an official state insect. Who would have thought of that? Oh, a teacher, yeah, in Aurora, Melinda Terry. I do not know what her motivation was, but she came up with the idea, if we got a state bird, a state fish, a state ant, we should have a state insect. So she put her students on it, and they went to work, and they did all kinds of research, and they came up with the idea that this butterfly, the Colorado hair streak, should be our official state insect. Because there are more of them in Colorado than any of the other states where they occur. So she went to work on it and it was back to that, okay, well other students should have some say to and other people. And a lot of people said the honeybee should be our state insect because it's so important to pollination of crops and what have you. Well the honeybee was brought in from Asia so it's an exotic species. It's not native to North America. So that kind of fizzled away after a little while. but. The Colorado hair streak is the only species in its genus, so it's a one of a kind, so to speak. And they occur in Idaho, Oklahoma, Wyoming, Texas, but they show up there as adults that are wandering after breeding or they get blown by storms or high winds, but that's not really where they live. 
So most of them are actually in Colorado and New Mexico. So one of the things that's interesting about them is you typically think of butterflies coming into flowers and, and sipping nectar, but this species takes no flower nectar at all. Its favorite food is the sap that oozes out of wounds on woody plants, shrubs and trees. So it, it gets its energy source from sap from woody plants instead of nectar from flowers. Kind of unique among butterflies. Well, one of the things that's special about it is the caterpillars are really finicky and the only thing the caterpillars of the Colorado hair streak will eat are oak leaves. And we have about three, maybe four different species of oaks that naturally grow wild in Colorado. And if you were to draw a map in Colorado of the distribution of gamble oak and then draw a map of the distribution of the Colorado hair streak, those two maps would be almost identical. Because if there are no oaks, there's no food supply for the caterpillar. I've actually seen some Colorado hair streaks in Loveland and Fort Collins over the years, but they're adults that get blown in or wander in, but there are no populations of oaks here that are substantial enough for them to support their youngsters. To get into the real oak scrub, you gotta get down by Castle Rock. And that's kind of the northern boundary of where the youngsters are, and that's right. That is a pretty plain looking caterpillar, don't you think? Yeah. It just kind of looks like a lobe on the leaf of the um, oak. We have a state reptile. And this too is another bit of a challenge, you see. <laughs> when you and I were in school, in order to get an A on the biology test, we had to know that there were basically five groups of vertebrate animals, fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And the reptiles included things like turtles and alligators and snakes and lizards, the tuataras from New Zealand, and that sort of thing. Well, if you put that on the test today, you would get a D plus or a D minus because we no longer recognize reptile as a valid taxonomic grouping because with new testing techniques, new knowledge, and all kinds of things, we now realize that turtles aren't related to anything. They're turtles and that's about as good as it gets. And then you have snakes and lizards and they're related to each other but not that closely to turtles or to alligators and it turns out that alligators and crocodiles share more in common anatomically and chemically and DNA wise and that sort of thing with birds than they do with snakes and lizards. Mm -hmm. And so now we lump birds and alligators together in a grouping called archosaurs. You are taking notes, right? <laughs> yeah. And the whole idea of reptile is fading away and it's kind of an old school usage but it's not making its way into the future very much. And so really our state reptile should be a state turtle. So of 45 inland turtles, not counting sea turtles because we're not going there, five turtles naturally live wild in Colorado and they mostly live out on the plains. And since we settled this area and we started building reservoirs and putting in irrigation ditches and canals and what have you, the whole turtle population of eastern Colorado has really prospered from this. But people take turtles on as pets. And then after a while, mom gets tired of taking care of the pet turtle that the, the kids grew tired of and bored with. And so one day the turtle goes down to the pond in City Park and gets turned loose. Is anybody familiar with that <laughs> protocol? Yeah. So we have these small spot populations of turtles in western Colorado and Grand Junction, Durango, what have you, where pet turtles have been turned loose and they survive. So this became our official state turtle back in 2008, our state reptile. And as you can guess, I have a few thoughts about this. <laughs> One, as a species, painted turtles occur in 46 states, um, 
nine Canadian provinces, and one Mexican state. And as a subspecies, the western painted turtle is in 27 states, five Canadian provinces, and one Mexican state. It is the most widespread turtle in all of North America. What makes it special to Colorado? <laughs> Nothing! <laughs> <laughs> Whereas we have this guy, a lizard. Now if you're going to deal with state reptiles and you're going to ignore that whole reptiles aren't really a natural group anymore sort of thing and you're going to run with reptile, this is a much better candidate. The triploid checkered whiptail only occurs in the state of Colorado and nowhere else. It grows to be about that long. It's pretty fast and it lives down in the Arkansas River Valley. So you can find it from Pueblo out towards uh, La Junta and, and Los Animas and what have you. And yeah, if this is, is unique to the state of Colorado, doesn't that say more about who we are as a state than a turtle that's in 45 other states? Am I the only one who sees this stuff? <laughs> But I kind of get an idea how complicated this can be because it's called triploid, checkered whiptail. Triploid means it has three times the normal amount of chromosome material than what should normally be there. Well, with modern testing techniques and the knowledge we have about DNA and genes and chromosomes and that sort of thing, what the testing now shows us is that sometime in the past, two different species of whiptails spent the night together and had babies. And so they were hybrids and they were fertile and they could reproduce. And so we got this population of these, these hybrid whiptails. And then sometime later, along came a third whiptail species and mated with the hybrid species. And the females lay eggs that are perfectly fertile but the trick is, there are no males. There are no male triploid checkered whiptails. They're all females. <laughs> and so when they develop eggs, the eggs go ahead and develop into embryos and they lay the eggs, the eggs hatch and they come out and they're all females and they're all genetically identical to their mothers. <laughs> this could be complicated to explain to school kids. <laughs> So that may be a reason why they never went that route. But then again, it was school kids that came up with the idea of turtles because who doesn't love a turtle? You know, a turtle could have been the, the inspiration for Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh, you know? Just kind of like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Thing 10, we have a state amphibian and it's a salamander. Well, there are 103 salamander species in North America and only one of them occurs in Colorado. This one, the tiger salamander. I don't know about you, but as a naturalist, I think we got cheated. <laughs> However, these guys are all over everywhere. They occur down here on the plains and you can go all the way up into the mountains and find them in ponds at tree line in, in the mountains at 11,000 feet. And they're kind of amazing. They'll eat anything. I mean, anything. So it became our official state uh, salamander. So it's either this one or it's none at all. Has anybody ever seen one of these guys? Yeah. The, the big ones will get to be a foot long. And so they're pretty substantial. And one of the things about them is if they can catch it, they'll try eating it. I had a group of people out on a tour one time and we stopped at this pond and we were looking around the pond and, and here was a salamander and it was eating some nestling birds. And they were baby horned larks that nest on the ground and the salamander had found them and we watched it eat three of the four babies. And people said, why don't you stop it? And it's like, this is a natural process and it's not up to people to impose on this and say, no, don't do it. And so people were kind of intrigued and grossed out at the same time and <laughs> kind of felt sorry for the baby birds. And I've actually seen one of these guys swallow a baby mouse. They eat little frogs, tadpoles, they'll eat worms. You know those moths that everybody loves to hate? Millers, they eat those, yeah. 
good. Yeah, so it's kind of, kind of an amazing salamander. But, just like they eat a lot of things, a whole lot of things eat them. <laughs> Great blue herons and black crown night herons catch a lot of them. Snapping turtles eat them. Um, big fish like largemouth bass will eat them and that sort of thing. So they're pretty common. Um, they show up in people's window wells. They show up in gardens and they will live underneath sheds and, and that sort of thing. Quite often when people have excavations done to replace a water line or a gas line or something, there are old tree roots that have rotted away and it leaves these, these tunnels through the soil. And these things are able to get down in there and find those, and they live in those old uh, tree root tunnels, what have you. So you may not see them, but that doesn't mean they're not around. They really are pretty common. Thane 11, we have a state pet. Actually, it's state pets, and it applies to dogs and cats. This was effective six years ago. It's part of a nationwide campaign by an organization to bring to focus that we have enough cats and dogs in the United States, we don't need more. So instead of, of encouraging the breeding of more cats and more dogs, why not, if you want one, adopt one that's already here? And one of the things that's motivating this is the incredible rate of euthanasia of unadopted, unadoptable pets. Just in the United States alone, every year, we euthanize several million cats and dogs because nobody will adopt them. And cats have some other things going for them, but not for the rest of the world. There's a guy back associated with the Smithsonian Zoological Research Institute by the name of Mara. And he used some uh, techniques where he would, uh, he, he got volunteers who were owners of cats and he put little microchips in them so he could follow them with, with receivers, with satellite and stuff. And just to cut to the chase, by following these animals and monitoring them for a year and then doing the math and the statistics based on the data they found, the average household pet cat in the United States kills 100 birds a year. And most people have no idea that their cat does that. Well, when you multiply that times the number of cats, the statistics say in the United States every year we are losing as few as four and a half billion to as many as six billion birds a year to house cats. And the house cats don't eat them because they go home and they get food at home. But they are predators that are programmed to catch things and so they do. But when they're out roaming around at night, the cat owners don't know what their cats are doing. So if you put me in charge, <laughs> there would be a reversal of things here. We would stop licensing cats. What good does it do to put a license on a cat? Nothing. You would license the cat owners. <laughs> and you don't get to have a cat until you take a class and find out how bad a cat can be on local populations of wildlife. We have a professor at CSU in the wildlife department that did his PhD work on house cats in Los Angeles and house cats take more lizards, rodents, and ground birds than skunks, weasels, bobcats, and foxes put together. Now, if you don't know that kind of stuff, you can't make a good decision on whether to let kitty out at night or not let kitty out at night. And the reality is, cats should not be out wandering around. No. Keep them indoors, leash them up, or don't be a cat owner. Yeah. Have I made myself clear? Yeah. <laughs> is that cranky part coming across yet? <laughs> so, that is kind of cute. But what happens is people get emotionally involved. 
So our official state pets were intended to draw attention to this, this high level of euthanasia and this huge population of adoptable animals. We don't need to keep breeding more. It's kind of a cry for help, but involves an emotional solution to an intellectual problem. We have enough knowledge to know what cats do that we need to make some cultural changes and shut it down. To know this and then do nothing about it is intellectually and academically indefensible. And I won't have it. How about corgis? Yeah. Cats <laughs> birds. Uh -oh. He stays in at night. <laughs> Besides that, it. 12 years old and going deaf, I think a robin could whoop him. <laughs> they are kind of cute, but we get so involved in cuteness and aesthetics and charm and emotions that we refuse to make intellectual decisions that make more sense. And this is why we need to have conversations about this and bring this up again and again and again because this could take years before we get meaningful action on this. What, uh, what corgi? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these were buddies for a while. This was Cody that I lost three Christmases ago. He's the guy that got between me and the bear one night. Oh. And when a dog gets between you and a bear and tells the bear to take off, that's more than a pet. Yeah. That, that's a soulmate. The corgi, on the other hand, knows a bear when he sees one. <laughs> Maybe. So, the difference here is the corgi was adopted at five and a half years old as a surrender dog to the Larimer County Humane Society. So he is recognized by statute as an official state pet. But Cody was purchased as a puppy by my son's girlfriend who gave him to my son as a Christmas present. And then my son moved and Cody came to live with me and the next thing you know is he's my dog not yours sort of thing so he did not qualify as a state pet but the corgi did qualify as a state pet there are always ways to complicate things this adopting him at five and a half there was a young married couple that had them. They divorced and both of them ended up in a place, in an in a apartment or what have you, where they weren't allowed to have pets. So they gave him up to the Larimer County Humane Society. And my wife found him there and decided she was going to adopt them without talking to me. <laughs> and so we got him and he came home. And he had spent the first five and a half years of his life in a kennel cage in an apartment oh, no. and this this dog had no awareness of the world at all so the first time I took him for a walk the day we brought him home we're walking along and a breeze comes up and a leaf comes scooting across the road and he took after that leaf and it was <laughs> the corgi thing that corgis do because that thing moved and it needed his attention and he ended up by finding a spider on our patio and I, I swear to God it had to have been his first spider because he was absolutely determined he was going to herd that spider and so the spider would take off and he'd go after it and the spider would turn and he'd turn with it and the next thing you know he had herded the spider into our garage <laughs> and it just the stories go on and on and on on that first walk, I couldn't figure out why he kept pulling away until it, it finally dawned on me, five and a half years in a crate, he didn't have hardened toe pads. And walking on the hot asphalt and the concrete was hurting his toes and he was wanting to walk in the shade and walk in the grass. Oh. And so I had to be careful how long I took him out until his toe pads hardened off which they have done in the last seven years and now it's kind of like uh, shouldn't we be going for a walk again so, there are days I'm not sure whether I'm walking him or whether he's walking me so we have state pets 
And then finally, thing 12, we have an official state cactus, the Claret Cup. And in some of our wildflower books, instead of calling it Claret Cup, they refer to it as King's Crown Cactus. So it all depends on which book you get as to which American name they use, but the Latin name is the same. And so it does kind of have some pretty flowers to it, does it not? Yeah. Well, we have 16 cactus species in Colorado, and the Claret Cup at one time was in the top three in terms of abundance. But over about a 50-year period from the early 1900s into the 1950s, 1960s, it was dug up and marketed commercially as a rock garden and xeriscape garden type of plant and because of the bright red flowers people liked them and the next thing you know they had completely disappeared from large portions of the range and they were gone a hundred percent gone not just sort of kinda but entirely gone and so there had to be some some things done and they were included as a threatened species in the state of Colorado which meant they could no longer be dug up for the garden trade well, uh, we managed to save them and they're coming back in some areas and they're still doing okay in other areas. And the largest one in the state of Colorado has over 300 individual above ground stems, but they're all connected underground by the same stem system. And here you can see some of the little red flowers on it. Yeah. This is at Yucca House National Archaeological Site or National Historic Site down outside of Cortez. It's about eight and a half miles outside of Cortez. And it's, it's a really small area. It's only eight or ten acres or something like that. On my left, if you go over this way, the actual Yucca House Kiva is only 50 feet away from it. It's that close. And of course, for a guy like me, I can't not go find a thing like this. So I went down and found it. Whew, that's a lot of things for one day. Do you remember all 12 of them? How many state symbols do we have? 25, yeah. And we have 12 that are related to nature. Thing one is the Colorado Blue Columbine as it is officially named outside of the legal system and what have you was our first wildlife state symbol and it was established in 1899 and then along came the lark bunting as our official state bird in 1931 as a result of a class project. I couldn't find out anything about Roy Langdon so I went to the Discovery Center in Fort Collins and they have old yearbooks from the old high school days so I read a biography of him in the old yearbooks and then I went to the telephone books and looked up his old addresses in the old telephone books of the days gone by. Do you know where the Taco Bell is at the intersection of College and Prospect up in Fort Collins? Yeah. And you know how they tore out a house on the corner to put in a parking lot there? The house they tore out used to be Langdon's house. So he ended up by moving to Salt Lake City after a retirement to be near one of his daughters or something. That's where he passed away. So I went to CSU to the library and I looked up his obituary in the Salt Lake City newspaper and that's how I found out about Roy Langdon. There, just a little bit of effort in getting all of these details. The blue spruce was voted the state tree in 1892 but was unofficial but it was made official in 1939. Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep became our official state animal but it really should be a state mammal. Stegosaurus became our official state fossil in 1982. There are three species of stegosauruses that have been found so far in the state and any one of the three qualifies. Uh, thing six, blue grama became our official state grass in 1987 and it was a move to try and get people to understand how important grass was to settlement times and to ecological stability to this day. Thing seven, the greenback cutthroat trout is now our official state fish. The rainbow was never officially designated and the greenback is a subspecies, not a full species. And in 1996, the Colorado hair streak became our official state insect. And in uh, 
2008, the Western Painted Turtle became our official state reptile. Thing 10, the tiger salamander became our official amphibian in 2012. And thing 11, we have state pets, cats and dogs that are in rescue shelters needing adoption. And finally, in 2014, thing 12, the claret cup or king's crown became our official state cactus. So if you look at that date, it has been five years since we have come up with a new state symbol. <laughs> Just hang on to that for a second. Yeah. That's kind of uh, a bunch for one day, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions? Is anybody too numb to have a question? Yeah. <laughs> your bunting was black and white in the lettering. How come? Your, your ends were black on the you're the first person to notice that. No, I <laughs> You're the first person to mention it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the male bird is all black with a white wing. So when I spelled out bunting, it just seemed like a cute thing to do to see if you were awake. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And you were. I did this yesterday at a library and nobody noticed that nobody said a word. So you guys are ahead of them. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so how do these stegosaurs differ? Have they got three toes or something? <laughs> or what? No, and it, it's like with uh, differences in squirrels or differences in mice or that sort of thing. There are skeletal features and tooth features that are distinguishable species to species. And so that's what gives us a way to figure out which ones are which. So if he's coming at us, so I won't be able to tell right away? Uh, I don't think you're going to have to worry about that, <laughs> yeah. except maybe in a dream because you enjoyed a Rocky Mountain High before you went to bed. <laughs> yeah? Is there anything left that we need to propose as a... <laughs> See you next time, folks. Thanks for coming.